And uh, again, thank you to all of you for uh, what you have done to make today uh, extra special. <clears throat> there's always, remember this, there's always people in the background uh, doing things that what looks smooth and easy and what look, makes for a, a great service is always because there's multiple uh, factors at work. Uh, so I want to thank the deacons because uh, what you saw in that breakfast was a comp combined effort behind these men to provide for the women um, a thank you to the mothers. Uh, what you saw in that video was two days worth of work. And I'm sure Sister Nellie doesn't have anything better to do than just to sit and do a video, but she took the time to do that, and I'm thankful to that. And uh, all the little pieces. And so I'm thankful because these people don't seek uh, attention. They don't seek a thank you. They do it because they love the Lord. Amen. And I'm thankful to, to all of you because uh, we're a team, and we're a pretty good team at that. If you have your Bibles with you, if you'll turn to the uh, book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 to 19. The book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 to 19. And if you're able, if you'll please stand in honor of God's word, please. I also want to uh, welcome our guests, and it's good to see Diego here this morning, and uh, glad to see him. And yes, it's good to see Mickey. She uh, traveled a long way, so she doesn't like attention either, so I like embarrassing her too. But uh, we're just thankful to see all of you, but especially our special guest today. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 19. And the word of the Lord says, And in the same region where there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day, in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Lord, Father, I thank you for this day, this wonderful day, Lord, where we celebrate, Lord, motherhood. And I thank you, Lord, for the message you have given to me and you placed into my heart. And most importantly, Lord, Father, I thank you for your spirit that enables me to be able to bring this message. For I am a lowly, wretched man. I'm unable to do these things. It's by your power, Lord Father. It's by your authority that we speak. Lord Father, I thank you for a place that I can call home, a place that we can consider a family, a place that you have brought to us, and a place that you have built for your honor, for your glory, and for your great name. May the women who hear this, may the mothers especially, be blessed by this message. And I thank you for this privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may, you may be seated. Thank you. I love the story of Leland Wang. He shares how when he was a child, he was very rebellious and disobedient. And one day, he was especially, when he was especially acting bad, his mother picked up a stick to spank him. But he took off running and she gave chase. And he was taunting her that he was too fast and that she couldn't catch him. He kept turning around and laughing at her. You can't catch me. But then his mother did something totally unexpected. She stopped right in her tracks. She, should, she stood tall and proud and she said, I'm ashamed of myself that I've raised a child who is unwilling to be disciplined by his mother when he does wrong. So I must punish myself. And she got down on her knees and she took that stick and she proceeded to whip her bare arm. 
And Leland said that he was so moved and shocked and touched by his mother's actions that he immediately ran back to his mother and he jumped in her arms and he begged her to stop hurting herself. Hit me instead. I'm sorry, Mom. But there was no further discipline needed. The lesson had been learned. And Mr. Wang said that from that moment, he changed. He began to respect and honor and love his mother. And he said that when he grew up and he heard the gospel first time, for the first time preached to him, and how Jesus had sacrificed himself by taking the punishment for humanity's sins, he said, I readily received it. It was easy to understand it, you see, because I had already seen the display of that love from my own mother. And Leland Wang went on to become one of China's great 20th century evangelists, spreading the gospel throughout his country, teaching them a love that he first learned from his mother. Happy Mother's Day to all of the beautiful mothers out there. And for those of you watching online, if there's any mothers out there, happy Mother's Day to you as well. And today as we celebrate motherhood, I want to share a story about a mother that to me I think displays the love that God has ordained for this office of motherhood. We celebrate this office, and that person is Mary. And I want to tell you that in evangelical circles, Mary has become some sort of an unwritten taboo. Evangelicals are a little hesitant to talk about Mary because in some ways they acknowledge her, but they hold her at arm's length. And that's primarily because of the exaggerated role that the Roman Catholic Church has given to her. So the mistake now is made that while the Roman Catholic Church may give her too much credit or, or put her in a light that is not consistent with the word, evangelicals may make the mistake of not giving her the credit that she is due. And so what we should do is tell her story. But we tell the truth of the story according to God's word. Because even though Mary may not be the queen of heaven or may have lived the perfect sinless life like the Romans, uh, uh, Roman uh, faith says... She was nonetheless a faithful mother. And I think that her story teaches us the beautiful display of motherhood. And that is what I want to tell you about. And so I want to take you on a journey today, a mother's journey. And so we're going to be going through different versions of the uh, 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 parts of the gospel to see her story. But I want you to take a walk with her. I want to take you through a mother's journey through the eyes of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And that story begins, actually, in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. So if you have your Bibles with you, if you'll notice in Luke chapter 1, 26, this is where Mary first encounters this incredible vision. The angel Gabriel appears to her and says, you are going to be blessed with child. And we start in verse 30. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. It's not every day when a mother, or actually in this case, a young virgin, hears that she's about to bear not just the Son, but the Savior of the world, the Son of God, the, the foreordained Messiah. He's going to come through you. It's not every day. Verse 34, and Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Verse 38, and Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. We should not be so quick to overlook Mary's response without pondering its true weight. Here is an angel that tells her, this young virgin, you will be pregnant with child. You will not know a man, but you will be pregnant with child. Let it be 
whatever you will, I'm your servant. The humility and the courage of this young, soon-to-be mother don't overlook the strength that this took. God's plan for Mary was marvelous, but it was also dangerous, and it would not be easy. She was a young virgin, and in those days when a young girl was betrothed to another, the marrying age in those days was about 15 to 16 years old. And she was in love, and she was betrothed to this good man, Joseph. But then God threw a monkey wrench in her life. But to really appreciate why I say there was courage in these words, there was faith and there was strength in this young girl's uh, a declaration, let it be whatever you will, you have to go back to Matthew chapter 1. You have to see it from Matthew's version. Go with me, please, to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife but knew her not until she had given birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. I want you to notice two things. Notice what it says in verses 18 to 19 that when she was found to be with child that Joseph being a just man he was going to not shame her but he was going to just divorce her quietly. What's going on here? Betrothal in those days, it was more serious than, it wasn't, you weren't married just yet, but it was way more serious than just being engaged. You were practically married, you just had not um, been intimate together. So in order to break this betrothal, a formal divorce had to occur. But there's more to this than that. Do you know what the punishment was for a young girl to be found to be pregnant without knowing a man? I mean, without having... Been, being with a man who's married, stoning to death. In other words, when this girl said, let it be, whatever your will is, I am your, your servant, she was taking a decision that risked her very life. To agree to become pregnant without being married was to put her very life in God's hands. And Joseph being a good man, could have easily have taken her before everybody to save his honor and said, look what she's done. Stoned her, killed her. I'm innocent. But he was a good man. And he was going to divorce her quietly. And Mary, in making that declaration, she loved Joseph. She was going to marry him. She understood by saying, I'm your servant. She understood that she was possibly even going to lose him. But she trusted God with her life. Her very life, literally. She knew, if this is of God, then my life is in his hands. I won't die because God's made a promise to me. The point I'm trying to make is that Mary told no one. Not even Joseph. She could have come and told everybody. She could have pled her case. She could have said, wait, 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 let me explain to you. She could have come to Joseph, look, you got to believe me. Please believe me. And she said, no, that's God's job. My job is just to, to be ready to be a mom. My job is to be a mom, and everything else is God's job. So she told no one, not even Joseph. And she was right, because the angel took care of that and spoke to Joseph. She knew that if she lost even her husband, that she would be okay. Because God was with her. 
She knew that if she had to go through it alone, she would be okay because God was with her. To all of you single mothers out there, God bless you. Be fervent, be strong. Mary was willing to go wherever she had to go as long as God was with her. Motherhood is not easy. Motherhood is not easy. But if God is with you, you won't fail. The second thing I want you to notice is what is said about this location, and it's found actually in Luke. I want you to know that when Mary has this vision, I want you to notice what it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. I want you to notice where it happens. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. This is where Mary lived. This was her home. Did you know that there was an archaeological discovery of the ancient city of Nazareth? It's still there today, but they found the original site. What did Nazareth look like in the day of Jesus? And did you know that they found it to be a location of about four acres with only about 50 houses? Only about 50 houses and about four acres. Well, what's your point, Irving? It was a small town. Any of you ever lived in a small town? You know what small towns are like? You know what a young virgin who shows up pregnant? You know what she's going to experience in a small town? I want you to imagine the looks, the whispers, the gossip, the sneers, the judgment. And she endured it all. And she told nobody. Because she didn't need to prove herself to anybody. She had a job to do. And she trusted God. I'm going to be a mom. That's all I need to know. God will take care of the rest. And in Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55, we hear Mary's heart through the song of praise, and it's called the Magnificat. This is where Mary praises the Lord in realizing that she's about to bear, son, to bear a son who will save the world. I want you to ask yourself, where did Luke get these, this information when you read at the beginning of Luke's gospel, he says, I took great care to go and interview and investigate all of the, the, the accounts of the life of Jesus. But where did he get this from? He had to have gone to Mary and sat down with her and he says, tell me about your baby. Tell me your version. And this is what she says. Listen to what she says in verses 46 through 55, especially I'm going to read 46 through 49. And Mary said, in realizing all of these things, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. She doesn't say, look what a marvelous woman I am. Look, I'm better than everybody else. Look, I'm so great that, that God has chosen me out of everybody. No. My soul magnifies the Lord. Don't look at me. Look at what God has done. That's what mothers do. They look and they look at the, the, the life of their child and they'll say, Lord, I have no idea how I got here, but I know it was through your love and your grace and your mercy and your strength and your patience and your providence, Lord, that I made it this far with this child. Lord, I had no clue what to do. I had no strength. I had no wisdom, but you gave it all to me. The truly godly mother knows where to give thanks. Amen? Amen. Mary embraces motherhood and all the challenges that come with it. And my friends, motherhood is a challenge. It's the greatest of things. It's the most noble of things. But it has its challenges. There isn't a mother here that hasn't wanted to to tear her hair out because her kids frustrate them. Not in my house. I'm sure it doesn't happen in mine, but I'm sure in other houses. Motherhood is difficult. It's a challenge. But there's no more noble task. Look at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. So Mary's story continues. She rejoices. She accepts the challenge. She endures the sneers and the judgments and the looks and the gossip. She risks her life. 
She risks losing the husband that she's about to have, but the Lord is gracious. He preserves her. He preserves her husband. And she begins her journey. And look at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And so it comes after nine months that now the birth of Jesus Christ is about to happen. Verses 1 through 7. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Verse 4. Notice that because of the imperial census, here the emperor says, hey, we're going to take a census. So everybody needs to go back to their original hometown and be accounted for. And so, of course, here they are there in Nazareth and they have to go down to Bethlehem because that's where his hometown is. And so Joseph and Mary have to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. You know how far Bethlehem is from Nazareth? It's 97 miles. 97 miles. At an average of about 15 to 20 miles if you go by donkey. Remember, they didn't have airplanes back then. It's going to take about a week's journey. During the ninth month, the final month, of Mary's pregnancy. Hey, honey, are you in a good mood right now? <laughs> I just got this letter. So look, we're going to have to go to uh, Bethlehem to take the census. When are we going? Uh, tomorrow. But the good news is we got a donkey, and I'm going to let you ride most of the way. <laughs> in verse 7, she goes into labor as soon as they get there. Oh, joy, I bet that was a fun trip. What mother in her ninth month of pregnancy wouldn't love to take a journey over rocks and, 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 and desert and go down there riding a donkey and about to give birth? But when this happens, God is already glorifying her. He's already preparing her. They arrive in Bethlehem, but there's no room in the inn. You notice? Verse 7, because there was no place for them in the inn, they have to go to a manger. And a lot of people don't understand what a manger is. And I've seen pictures where the manger is all pretty and it's nice. And Christians, they love to adorn things that belong to Jesus. But you need to understand what a manger was. And I think I brought a picture. So I, I try to find something that was as close to the picture as possible. When we say manger, this was a place where animals were kept. This was a place where animals were kept. I think it's the next one. There we go. It probably didn't smell very good. Mothers, I want you to imagine burying a child after a week's journey, 97 miles on a donkey, and there's no room at the hotel. Hey, honey, uh, I went and checked with the hotel. There's no room. But hey, they got a horse's stall right around the back. The discomfort and the smell. Now, we go back to verses 8 to 19, what we first read. And I want you to look at it now from the perspective of Mary. Look at verses 8 to 19 again. And you notice, while Mary is giving birth, God is already providing. He's already glorifying his son and, pro and the provision for Mary. Notice, his angels appear to shepherds who are nearby. And they're informed of the good news. And do you notice in verses 10 to 12. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And after the angels sing and they depart, the shepherds go looking for the child. In verses 17 to 19, and when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them. They told them, you're not going to believe how we got here. You're not going to believe what we heard. You're not going to believe why we're here. 
And all who heard it wondered, amazed at what the shepherds told them. In verse 19, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. My mom kept treasures too. I miss my mother, especially on Mother's Day. And she used to keep little newspaper clippings. And she used to keep every birthday card, every Mother's Day card, every Christmas card. She kept photos. She kept everything about her kids. See, her treasure wasn't money. Her treasure wasn't anything the world could give her. Her treasure was her children and her grandchildren. And she kept every photo, everything. And if you dared even suggest to throw anything away, she'd kill you. And when she passed away, we found boxes and boxes of little things that she would find. Newspaper clippings about a grandson's achievement here or, or a photo or a, a, a Christmas card or, or anything. She even had a little, little uh, plastic little bracelet that Kayla had made to her when, for her when she was little. She had never thrown it away, even when it broke. She never threw, threw it away. Mothers keep treasures. Do you know that according to Jewish purification customs, when a child was born, they had to wait 40 days to purify themselves. The mother needed to purify herself, and then after 40 days, they needed to go and present the child to the Lord. And that's exactly what Joseph and Mary did. Look at Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 38. We continue this journey with Mary. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses... Forty days later, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Verse 24. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was a righteous and devout man waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation." that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father, father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed him and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. So Joseph and Mary went up to Jerusalem to dedicate their child, and they, uh, they present two, two doves, which is indicative of how poor they were. This was the offering of the poor. And a man named Simeon comes up and picks up the child and blesses the child and declares this, this incredible Fulfillment of prophecy. And I want you to imagine this scene. I want you to imagine what's happening, especially in this scene where Simeon arrives. This temple wasn't like what we would see today where maybe only four or five people were there. This was the temple of Jerusalem. This is where thousands of people are there. And they come up to this great and holy temple, and everybody's presenting, and there's a bustle of, of people moving around, a huge crowd, and they have Jesus there with them, and this man out of nowhere comes up and picks up the child. Mothers, how would you feel about that? You okay about that? And he doesn't just pick up the child. He says, Lord, I can now die in peace. I can now die because I'm looking. My eyes have now seen the salvation of the world. Imagine what Mary must have felt, what she must have thought when she heard this declaration. She must have treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Verses 34 to 35 is a special um, focus for us today. Look at this. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary. He now turns to Mary. He says, Mary, I, I have something I've got to tell you. 
I'm so happy to see this child. He's the salvation that we've all been hoping for. We've been waiting a long time for him. But I got to tell you something. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy for him, and it's not going to be easy for you. In fact, it's going to hurt. You're not going to like what you're going to see. In order for your child to fulfill what he was called to fulfill, it's going to hurt you. It's going to pain you to see what you're going to see. Nations are going to rise and fall because of him. Notice what it says. Behold, this child is appointed for the fallen rising of many in Israel. Indeed, like Isaiah said, the nation and the, its government will be upon his shoulders. And Mary, it's going to hurt. In fact, verse 35, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. It's going to come at a great cost, Mary. And it's going to be especially painful for you to see it. What you're going to experience is going to feel like a, you're a sword piercing your soul. Go with me to Zechariah chapter 12. What this man utters, what this man utters is the fulfillment of a prophecy. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. There's nothing more painful than for a mother to see their child suffer. And there were a lot of people that wept for Jesus that day on the cross, but none, none wept for him like his mother. As soon as Simeon leaves, let's go back to Luke. As soon as Simeon leaves, a prophetess now named Anna comes and praises Jesus in the presence of his mother. Notice what it says in verses 36 to 38. Luke chapter 2, verses 36 to 38. It says, Now, and there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She, not, she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. I pondered long and hard about this, uh, the significance of Anna and her testimony. I thought, well, here's just another, another person that's testifying to Jesus, right? Isn't it just like this other guy, Simeon? I mean, it's easy to overlook this. It's easy to say, okay, well, here's another woman who is testifying to Jesus. She comes and she praises Jesus in the presence of her mother. And we learn that her husband died only after seven years. And all the rest of her days, until she was 84, or it could possibly be for 84 years, depending on the way you interpret the Greek, what matters is that she's been there a long time waiting for this moment. She praises God, but I want you to see this from the aspect of a mother. I pondered on this. And then when I asked myself, how would this have sounded to Mary? And this is what the Lord put in my heart. Here's Mary, and she hears Anna, this prophet, this old woman come and praise the Lord for what she sees. And Anna's never had a child. Anna's never had an opportunity to, to hold her own son. And here she is. She's praising the Lord for just a moment. Just because she had a glimpse of Jesus. And here's Mary, and she hears his praise. And she says, wow. If this woman who can't have children, who suffered, unfortunately, the loss of her husband, as a widow, has lived all her days of her life, She's thankful just for a few minutes to look upon my child. And yet for me, how much more lucky am I? I get to hold him every day. I get to run with him and play with him. I get to feed him. I get to hug him. She's thankful just to look upon him. How blessed am I that I get to see my child every day? 
to love him, to see him. And she treasured these things, pondering them in her heart. So Joseph and Mary stayed for a while in Bethlehem. In fact, they stayed there for about two years until one night they get an unexpected visit. A group of bad guys show up. Middle of the night. And they're led by the Messiah's star and they find their way to Joseph and Mary's home. And they knock on the door. And we read in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, what unfolds. And going into the house, these mad guys saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They enter. I know you don't know us. Hey, how are you doing, Joseph? Hi, Mary. Hey, uh, you have a baby here? Yeah, how'd you know? Uh, I see that star there kind of told us to get here. Uh, could we see the child? Well, sure, he's right here walk in and they just bow down and they lay out these gifts. I wonder what they must have felt. What Mary and Joseph must have felt to see these great men worshiping their son and offering gifts. She treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. But these gifts weren't just a blessing. They were God's provision for what was happening. Because as soon as the Magi leave, Joseph and Mary are informed by an angel, you got to get out of here. King Herod is after your child. Whatever little time they had to be in awe and to rejoice now turns to utter fear. Go, get up, get your stuff, let's go. You've got to go to Egypt. They seek to destroy your child. And so they pick up everything they have, they can, and they leave the only life they know. They say goodbye to their friends and their family, and they go to the country that they don't know. They go to Egypt and they flee to a place they don't know, a foreign land, so that they can pr uh, protect their child. And there they hide for three years. We often forget the burdens that Joseph and Mary went through to preserve our Savior. And when they finally return, they don't come back to Bethlehem because Herod's son is there. Even though Herod's died, they still are in fear. So instead, they go back to Nazareth, where in Luke chapter 2, verse 40, it says that Jesus grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And the story continues. Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. I want you to notice what happens here. I think I've got the wrong... <clears throat> They, oh, I'm sorry, it's uh, Matthew. No, it is uh, Luke, I'm sorry. Luke chapter 2, if you have your Bibles with you, 41 to 52. Everybody there, amen? Amen. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover, and when he was 12, they went up to, according to custom, and when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they, went, uh, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. Verse 49, and Jesus said to them, Why are you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. See, Mary knew her son was special. She knew that he was God's son. She knew that he, that he had this incredible purpose, but she didn't completely understand it yet. There was times when she didn't completely understand her child. There are times when a mother just goes, I, I don't get this child sometimes. Is this my child? When he gets lost, she does what any mother would do. She panics. When she finds him in the temple, 
She scolds him, but then Jesus responds, and she doesn't understand it. And I want you to notice verse 51, but Jesus goes back to Nazareth and was submissive to them. That's okay, I know you don't totally get what's going on, but you're my mom, you're my dad, and I'll be submissive to you. I will honor you. So Jesus honors them as his earthly parents, despite their limitations, and his mother treasured up these things in her heart. And when it finally came for Jesus to begin his ministry, he gathered together his disciples. He gathered everyone together, and he began to preach. He began to do his miracles. He began to do all the things that he was supposed to do. And then he went back home to the place that Jesus said, where a prophet is not honored in his own home. And in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, we hear something amazing. It says, And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. So when Mary began to see how the promise that was first given to her by the Archangel Gabriel about what would happen to her son over 30 years ago, she did what any mother would do. She panicked. She didn't totally get it. She couldn't believe it. And at first, she wasn't a follower. At first, she wasn't a believer. She couldn't believe it. But like most mothers, she never turned her back on her son. Go with me to John chapter 19, verse 25 to 27. On the final day of Jesus' earthly life, while he hung on the cross, there his mother stood. She had never forgotten. She had never turned her back on her son. Never told me understood him. But it was her son. And there's no words to... I don't... I was going to tell you about what she would feel, but I'm unworthy. Who am I to say what she felt? All I can say to you is, it must have been a pain that I can't even describe. I'm not even worthy to say what she felt. I can just tell you it must have been an agony that, that I will probably never know. She knew he had a godly purpose. She may not have completely understood it, she never stopped being his mother. And in the final moments, I want you to notice what happens. John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. Everybody there, amen? Yeah. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Phobos, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold, your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold, your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. So in the final moments of Jesus' life, he commissions the beloved disciple, which I believe is John, to care for his mother. And this is strange. It's strange for one reason. Mary had other sons. According to ancient custom, there was no need for, for, for Jesus to, to entrust his mother with John. There was no need for that because Mary had other children. We know of at least two that became followers of their older half-brother, James and Jude. So what was the reason? Why? Why did Jesus declare John as his mother's son and Mary as John's mother? And let me tell you why. Because at the cross, Jesus was creating a new family. And in this new family, Jesus was inducting his mother to now the family of Christ. In other words, as Mary accepted Jesus as her son, now Jesus was taking Mary as his child. Mary was no longer just an earthly mother now. She was now a spiritual mother with a new identity with the spiritual family. And that is what each mother is in the church. If you are a follower of Christ, and if you're a mother, your child isn't just the one that's sitting next to you. You have been authorized, and you've been empowered to serve as a spiritual mother, as a mother to encourage, to, to guide, and to love, and to care for all his children in the church. God wants mothers in his church. God needs mothers in his church. He needs their guidance. He needs their love. He needs their support. He needs their encouragement. The young mothers need somebody to guide them and encourage them. The mothers need to know that love to give to the church. 
And that is what Mary would now begin to serve as in her new ministry as mother. And one final word. Go with me to Acts chapter 1. As we close this journey of Mary, where does it end? Does it end at the cross? Does it end there? Look at Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. After the ascension of Jesus, we now see the new baby church gathered together. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. This is after his ascension, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Now she is serving a new role as the mother for the church. But I want you to understand something. She is not the mother of the church like the Roman church will tell you. She's not the queen of heaven or the mother of God in some uh, divine fashion. She's a mother. She serves as a mother for the church in the same way that you do. She's a mother and a blessed mother at that. And as a mother, Mary suffered. She endured things that people shouldn't endure. As a pregnant virgin, she endured gossip and ridicule. She risked losing her husband and even her own life. She had a difficult pregnancy. She had to endure uh, living as a fugitive for years. And sometimes she just didn't understand her child. This was the burden of motherhood that, that was given to her. But she trusted in God. And more importantly, she trusted in God's plan for her child. And my sisters, if you want to do the, the godliest thing that a mother can do, the greatest thing that a mother can do is to give her child to God. And to understand that before they were your child, they first belonged to God. This is what Mary did. She endured what no mother should do. She watched her child suffer and die an unjust death. And it must have felt like a sword piercing through her soul. But she never gave up on God's promise. She never gave up on her child. And she was richly blessed for it. And she is indeed a blessed mother. So today, as we honor mothers, rejoice. Because motherhood isn't just a joy. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. Rejoice, not just in the, in the good things and the smiles. Rejoice in the poopy diapers and the crying and the, and the bad attitudes and all those things. Because through the Lord, God will equip you to guide your child in the way that they should go. And as we finish, I'm going to ask if you'll please stand. As we finish, the Lord has put in my heart, as we close in prayer, I'm going to ask my sister Tani to come, come up here. And I'm going to ask her to please stand up here. And I'm going to ask my deacons to come up. I want to especially pray for our sister as she's preparing for her next child. And I'm going to pray a special blessing over her. I want to pray for all the women, all the mothers. We honor you, but especially give thanks to the Lord because our church is growing. And Sister Karina's participating in that, in that growth. <laughs> but we thank the Lord and we pray for, for the Lord to bless her as he always has. So let's, uh, let's go to the Lord and close. Lord Father, I thank you for this day. Lord Father, I thank you for this message and I thank you for the privilege of of, of uh, having mothers that have shown us a love that helps us understand your love better. What can be compared to a mother's love? Lord Father, I thank you for my mother. I thank you for uh, all the mothers that are here in this church. And I know that every person here is thankful for the mothers they were given. And Lord, I lift up especially our young sister Karina. And Lord, I pray that you bless this child. We bless this child in your name, Father. We bless this child according to your promise that those who would give their child back to you, that those who would render glory to you 
acknowledging where this child comes from, Lord, they shall be blessed. And so, Lord, Father, by that promise and by your word, be blessed this child. Lord, may you protect my sister. May you keep her safe, her delivery, her pregnancy, everything, Lord, Father. We pray that all of this, Lord, be under your guiding hand of providence and of protection. Lord, Father, we pray that the, the Yamas household may be blessed richly through this. And in all their days, that your spirit may always richly dwell with them. May this child know you personally, Lord Father. May this child be raised according to your love and discipline. May this child come to know your son and his grace and his mercy and his love. Lord Father, thank you for this day and this privilege as we honor the office of motherhood. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you all for being here. And uh, we have guests here. And of course, we have mothers here. If you have not thanked or given a hug to a mother here, please do so before we dismiss. Amen, amen. Remember, we're getting, coming back together on Wednesday. And I hope that you all have a beautiful and happy Mother's Day. God bless you.